Welcome back to Get in the Cashflow Game with K&K, where we talk about investing in real estate, cash flow, building wealth, and all the lessons we learned along the way. And if you can, do me a huge favor. Please like and subscribe this podcast. Share it with your friends and family. That way we can continue to bring you value every week and get bigger and better guests on the show. Working on this for the past few months. You know we always want to bring as much value as we possibly can, and our partner, Prime Corporate Services, is all about bringing you a service you can't get anywhere else at a price you can't get anywhere else. Whether you're new to owning a business or owning a property, or you're an experienced property owner or investor, Prime Corporate Services is not only going to help you, but they're gonna make the process so much easier. So if you book a call, the first thing they're gonna do for you is help you understand what your business structure should look like. Your corporate structure, tax planning, estate planning, all of that. Maybe you're saying, I'm brand new to starting a business and all this sounds foreign and complicated. Remember, this company helps new people just getting started every day. They're going to help you form the entity that's best for you and walk you through the process. Before I found this company, we paid thousands of dollars to other attorneys, CPAs, and consultants to try to understand exactly how we need to be structured to be as protected as possible. We've also gone the other route and used online platforms to form entities which unnecessarily put us at risk. You guys, you don't have to do that with this company. They'll do all of these things for you at a reasonable price so you never have to think about saving money at the expense of exposing yourself to liability. We've searched high and low, and you will not find this much value anywhere else. All you have to do is schedule a free call today. Just go to primecorporateservices.info slash G-I-T-C-G. Once again, that's primecorporateservices.info slash G-I-T-C-G. We'll also leave the info for you in the show notes. All right. Well, Todd, thanks for coming on and joining us today. Super excited to jump into this conversation. Thrilled to be here. Wish I was in San Diego. It's cold here. <laughs> uh, it's you know it's nice here it's sunny at least we stopped with the rain it's so. a little chilly it's like 65 degrees outside nice. um so todd you've done i mean it you've done a lot of stuff um you still do a lot of stuff and yeah. if you could just kind of give everybody a quick the fastest version background about yourself and kind of how you landed where you are today that'd be awesome yeah, I mean, I've been at this a long time i i started when i was probably 11 knew i wanted to work on wall street Went to work on Wall Street kind of in the middle of college um, and eventually ran, started running my own hedge fund, ran syndication uh, at Dean Witter for, for part of the West Coast, kind of a, uh, a group of offices, raised money for a big deal. Um, Irvine Apartment Communities was like really one of the biggest deals I was part of. I think we wow. raised $682 million, and I sort of got the bug about REITs did every REIT you could ever know to man, eventually started a hedge fund, became a shareholder activist. And I'm giving you like a shortened version of what is probably going into my 34th year um, of doing this. And I've done everything from starting a biotech and bringing it public on the NASDAQ two years ago. I started the, the biotech five years before that. I've taken over uh, an American stock exchange company in 2004 called Franklin Capital. Uh, I bought a company called Surgical Medical, which ultimately sold to Stryker, which reads uh, sponges in the sterile field to prevent sponges from being left behind the body. We sold that for $120 million to Stryker. I've started a bunch of things that have not worked out. I've started a bunch of things that have worked out. I think we presently have around $650 million in assets. We're publicly traded on the New York Stock Exchange under my uh, last name, AULT. Um, we're one of the largest crypto miners in the U.S., we have a lender in California. We have a defense business. We have a crane company in Texas. We're a very diversified private equity uh, holding company. Um, we do a lot of things. I've been at it a long time. I think we have close to 500 employees now spread out over uh, three countries. Um, and uh, on our way to more than, I think, 200 plus million in sales for 23. I think last year we did somewhere in the hundred and something million plus, I don't know the exact number because we haven't reported the fourth quarter. Um, and uh, I got haters, I got people that love me, I got people that hate me. And uh, that's the nature of being a public guy. I've done a ton of real estate. I own a, an apartment building, a piece of land in Florida, St. Pete on Third Ave that we're building an apartment building on, um, a, a data center in Michigan, a brand new hotel that we're partners in that just opened up called Phuket's, which is in New York and Tribeca, in the heart of Tribeca. That was a $230 million hotel. And then we own four hotels outright in the Midwest, two, two, two 
if I can't speak, two Marriott's and two Hilton's. Um, and on March 1st, we're launching something called bitnile.com. So we have a pretty big team and a lot of things we do, uh, too many. So is it safe to say you're really good at raising money or you're really good at relationships? I mean, you do all this stuff. What makes you so good at doing all this stuff? Well, I really have, uh, you know, there's this acronym on Wall Street called Risk On, which I've sort of taken as my own trademarked and have a book coming out about it. And it's really about this idea, the R in uh, Risk On is for relationships. Everything starts with relationships. And from there, in investing in yourself, know your competition, et cetera. So I'm, um, I'd probably say it's relationships that are the, the, is the key. I mean, you guys are in real estate and cash flow. I got to assume that developing relationships in your county uh, around the people you know where you can get deals, everything starts with relationships. There's nothing else more important than that other than family. Absolutely. Yeah. I would say that relationships are kind of the number one thing and it's, it's kind of sets your foundation for everything that you're going to do. And, and then you realize how small every business you're involved in really is because we all kind of know the same people or similar people run in the same circles. So absolutely. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I, I would say to you, you said relationships are the number one thing. Obviously the most important relationship is the person you choose to be your spouse. And it's said all the time, but actually, now I'm only speaking from a male's point of view. And I know people sometimes when I say this, they say, you know, you're being sexist or whatever name they want to call me, but I can only speak from a male's point of view. And I am a male and that's my pronoun, right? <laughs> uh, that I think a man who wants to be an entrepreneur and chooses to be married to a woman, absolutely that is 95% of the most important thing you do first is making sure that that person's compatible with what you want to do. Um, there's an analogy that, you know, a man uh, marries a woman hoping nothing will change and a woman marries a man hoping everything will change. Like he won't go out as much, he won't party as much, et cetera. Uh, but if you can figure that part out about picking the right spouse and really they understand what you want to accomplish along the way, then you can be an entrepreneur, you can make money, you can go do things that are outside the the norm of having an eight to five job. Um, and I don't know where this uh, this conversation is going to go, but I think that's the most the first, the most important relationship and it, it feeds the groundwork for everything else. Yeah, huge. no, I, I agree. I mean, when we before we jumped on, you thought how long you guys been working together and you didn't realize, well, we work together, we're married, we have kids together. So we the one more question is how in the world do you work with your life, your wife and you don't you're not divorced and all this. And I, I think you just said, well, you got to be with somebody that's willing to understand this. And if you're not, that's a, it could be a problem or not. Right. So that's what you're kind of talking about. Yeah, I, if you uh I work with my wife. She runs our family office. <clears throat> so we have a family office that controls a bunch of our investments and she helps run that. She handles the day-to-day -day of the family office. I worked with her at our regular company at one point and that didn't work so well. In fact, I would argue that it was like, that doesn't work for everybody. Cause I was sort of like very aggressive in what I needed her to get done so that I could <laughs> pay bills and things that I needed done. And, and we ultimately brought in someone to manage that part of it. And that made things uh, work for us. Uh, I think that it's important if you're going to work with your spouse, that's in, that's another level. That's like another like level level, you know, but the funny part about my, my wife is that if I weren't working, I would, I would be with her all the time. In fact, I, I travel with her all the time. That's my favorite thing to do is to be with her. So I think this, back to back to the point about like you kind of know when you're married if you're headed home after work or if you want to go to the bar and hang out with your friends and you're not spending your time with your wife, right? So I my wife you know says you know occasionally still says, "Do you want me to go?" And I start just default that I want you to go everywhere I want. I'm, I am just come with me to everything I want to go to. Um, so if you can figure out how to work with your your spouse and be married. Stay married. That's even more impressive than me, because I I can tell you that I think that that your 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 situation where you work and are married does it's a harder gig, which means you got to have a solid relationship. Well, it definitely wasn't easy at times. Obviously, in the beginning, it's tough. But you know, I think the one thing that I get 
gathered from what you said is that working together wasn't great because you were essentially her boss. And so I think that when you you have a husband and wife that are working together, you, each person has to trust that the other person's playing their role and it can't feel like a boss employee situation because yeah. we, we definitely went through that too. <laughs> and then I was like, okay, yeah, that's not going to work. Yeah, so exactly. you shuffle things around and then you figure out how to do it. And I, and I, for me with her, the things that she's in charge of, I just like, I'm prepared to, to let her handle it her way. And as soon as I gave up the idea that I would tell her how to do it, I would just be like, you know, you got to figure it out. It's your thing. Do whatever you need to do. Right. And if you looked at the worst case consequences, I was able to figure out that that the worst, the worst thing that could happen wasn't that bad. So I just sort of gave up control of those things I couldn't control. Right. Um, but you know, it's, uh, I think one back to what I was saying about relationships is that, so she has to understand where I want to go. She has to agree that she wants to come with us. And I have to agree. The, the thing that worked out with my wife and I in the beginning was that she said, I want to have a family and I want to be home. Now I was married. I was married before. And when I married my first wife, I came out of poverty and went to college. Uh, I didn't, I wanted double income, no children, you know, sort of the dink model, right? I wanted double income, no children, and then eventually children. And then after we had children, I wanted her to still work and I wanted her to still work because that combined income was powerful. But after we got a divorce, you know, out of the blue, she wanted to get a divorce after 12 years. And I had two little kids, very little kids, basically like toddlers. Uh, I discovered that that wasn't important to me, right? And that I wanted to be the breadwinner and I wanted someone that was at home taking care of the family because I wanted a bigger family. So if you guys can just get together on what you want and it's true, right? You're not trying to make the other person happy that they actually want that, then it's powerful. Like I, I have an assistant who's told me by the time I'm 27, I want to have kids. She has a plan and she has a boyfriend and whatever leads to that scenario, she at least knows what she wants, right? It's important for people in a relationship to know what they want. And I segue that to uh, raising capital because you said how much, you know, raising capital is your specialty. I have probably raised $400 million over the last two and a half years and maybe five or 600 million over the last, say, seven years or so, right? Um, and those are all based on relationships to where if I raised money from you, if I, if I, you were an investor in a private deal of mine and it didn't work out, I would work hard to get, figure out a deal you could get into to make sure that I, you know, as my lawyers say, I don't leave any body behind, right? <laughs> before, I drag all the bodies with me, right? So the, the, the funny part about it is the public investors, the stock goes up and down. I can't control that. But my private investors who help me get control of companies, they've all drug along with me in goods and bad times. And so I find my private investors, the ones I have relationships with personal, they stick with me no matter what. Um, I find my public investors, if it, they buy it and it goes up, they had a great idea how smart they are. And if they buy it and it goes down, I'm a piece of shit and I'm an asshole. Right. Uh, so uh, that's what I've noticed about. And that's all that I don't have a relationship with them. Right. But if I have a relationship with someone, you can shoot your way out of any problems. You know, if you buy a house together and it's not working, you guys can figure out a way out of it. Yeah, we have a saying here just in our business with us, it's relationships over transactions. So just kind of how you are. It's like it's really that's just how we built our business. And it's like you might lose money on a deal. We would, but I really want to make sure we try to take care of the relationship as much as possible. But you know, so things can happen. What, what is what is your what is your what is the daily bread you guys work on? I mean, like when you guys are working together and you guys are putting your you're both earning off the same plate. How is it you guys are earning? So I do commercial financing. I'm a mortgage broker, and then Kenny's also a mortgage broker, but he does residential. So he does one oh, to four, wow. I do five plus. Yep. Oh, wow. So you both have a different niche. Yep. Yes. And then we invest in real estate, primarily multifamily here, just in San Diego focused. One of my favorite things. Yeah, one of my favorite things. Yep. But in the San Diego area. Yep. Yeah, we've looked elsewhere and I just feel like until we can buy something bigger, like, I mean, Grant Cardone told us, you know, go buy a hundred million dollar building, just figure it out, <laughs> just do that. Yeah. Um, but until we can buy a bigger building. I, it doesn't make sense for me to fly all over the country to view my assets and things like that. So we're staying in San Diego for right now. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of where we're at. I think Grant's idea is right. 
I mean, you guys should, I, I don't know you well enough to say you should strive to do this, but if I, I suspect if you've been at this this long, that you're both go-getters um, from what I read about you guys are. So I would think that you would want to buy something that you can achieve a little bit more of if the numbers make sense, right? You want to reach up a little bit because we know the only way we make money, right, is leverage time, leverage people, and leverage money. And in the real estate game, you can leverage time because you have this enormous amount of time that people are paying you rent, right? You have this long time to pay it back. You can leverage money because you borrow against it. And so you're not putting up all the capital of the asset. And you can leverage people because in a multifamily, you have uh, enough people paying the rent that if you lose one or two, the world doesn't come to an end. Um, and there's nothing greater than it. I mean, the depreciation of the asset over time, uh, the, the 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 monthly cash flow from the lender, the the and then uh, the renters, and then in a cycle of a down cycle where you're able to finance at a lower rate, taking out capital. I mean, if people give it the right course, real estate is is by far, especially bought in the right area, the most. I would say the most controllable thing I've ever done is own real estate and Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. Now, I would argue that Bitcoin is a problem because you can sell it really easy, very liquid market, whereas real estate takes time to sell. And so the average human being, if they can't control their behavior, Warren Buffett talks about investors controlling their behavior. And most of the time, the investment isn't the problem. It's the person making the investment. That's a tough thing to, to argue about because like, wait a second, mm -hmm. if I put money in FTX, uh, I lost money. But yeah, if you didn't put all your money in FTX, you didn't lose all your money, right? Yeah. If you buy a piece of real estate, you're forced to be disciplined with what's the actual cash flow? What's the rent going to go up to? What's my maintenance? What I got to put aside for that maintenance? What's my reserve fund? So it's forced discipline on humans that otherwise, can you imagine every day if you could trade your real estate in and out, that every day there was a new price and the guy said, hey, I'll buy the building for you for a million dollars. Hey, it's 99,000, but tomorrow I'll buy it from a million one. Wait, wait, I'll pay a million two. If you had to deal with that every day, you, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't make sense. So real estate has that sort of Albert Einstein, you know, eighth wonder of the world, which is this compounding effect that I tell people, if you're not a disciplined investor, you should be in real estate because if you, it'll make you be disciplined and you'll have to spend the time with it. And even in 1990, when I was a really early stage investor right out of school, uh, even when I made some poor investments in 90 and 91 and 92, they still paid out over time. And time solves a lot of mistakes we make, especially in the real estate game. Absolutely. It's funny. I hear you argue the, the, make the case for real estate being, you know, not being liquid as a positive, because I talk to a lot of people who are, you know, maybe they aren't in real estate. They believe in the stock market or that's what they know. And they only invest in stocks and that's the downside for, of, to real estate for them. Yeah, but it's, it's, but they're wrong. They, they, they fundamentally will get their ass kicked in, in the stock market. They, everybody in the stock market eventually takes and has a drawdown of 20 to 50%, okay? They're wrong when they say that. It's just, it's factually incorrect. They cannot tell me that they never have to have a drawdown. We had the S&P down for 2022. 20, we had the NASDAQ down, we had the Dow down, and some individual small caps were down 90%. I've suffered that pain. Now, I apply real estate to my stock. So I own, I've owned some stocks for five, six, seven years. I mean, I bought Disney 100 years ago. I don't even remember when I bought it. And so- if you apply this mentality, you, you're no person, I don't care who they are, over time won't suffer a drawdown. Anyone who plays the market over time, even the biggest funds, eventually have a, a pullback. They just do. They make mistakes. They get concentrated. It's a rarity that someone in the market. I mean, Buffett will tell you that even Berkshire Hathaway has declined like 50% more than three or four times. And so- they're delusional if the market doesn't have a tremendous amount of risk. Whereas the basic assumption, and this is such a flaw for people to say this, is that they may feel like that since they can control their asset and when they buy and sell, that they have the physical discipline to know when to do that, the mental capacity to handle it. But the reality is, is that people have to have a place to live. And that inherently makes owning apartment buildings safer. Now, you can overpay for them. 
right? And there's moments of time where they're they're undervalued. And there's moments of times where you're paying up too much because you're striving for that cap rate. And you're like, wait, I'm going to pay a 4% cap rate. And in California, there's insanity in some places, uh, you know, but if you can be disciplined about it and wait for an opportunity, there's no greater long-term thing that you can do than own real estate. There's, it's just not, I'm sorry. It just doesn't exist. Now, I don't mean like a commercial building that's out in the middle of the Imperial Valley where <laughs> yeah. you know, I'm talking about like someone owning an apartment building where they're part of it through syndication. They get to take that depreciation. I mean, I've told Grant, Grant and I've done some stuff and I, I've told him, I have a podcast with him where I told him flat out that his business model is incredible because he well, the way he syndicates. Now, people, and you've seen some lawsuits from some of the stuff that's happened with Grant. It's nonsense. If they read the prospectus, they know they're full of shit. They're, Grant's telling them everything they're doing. I've seen all these like naysayers and haters about him. He's letting the average guy get into real estate they otherwise wouldn't do. And this is, Grant and I don't always get along perfectly. I like him when I see him, uh, but you know, doesn't, I mean, I don't even want to say that we get along fine. I just mean that like, you know, we don't do a lot of business together anymore. I did a little bit with him. Um, but, but you're his right. He lets a lot of people like you can invest $5,000 and have a net worth of virtually zero and go into his deal. Most, most times you have to be accredited or sophisticated. And that really takes a lot of people off the table. Yeah, but he but the problem was is that he did those reggae's. He did the biggest reggae and he raised all that money around reggae. And then he got sued yeah. for lack of disclosure. And then it got thrown out. And now it's back in. But the reality is, is I read his prospectuses. Grant's doing the right thing. I don't agree with anybody about this nonsense of these YouTubers trying to get cred by saying he's a fraud. Grant's not a fraud. Now that I know of, he's not a fraud. I've seen his I know people in his real estate funds that get paid. I know the real estate he owns. And People confuse syndication with being risk-free, but if you're not going to own the real estate yourself, you should be in syndication. Uh, are you guys, do you guys syndicate at all or what do you guys do? Sorry. No, we'd probably buy bigger buildings if, if we were syndicating at all. So I've invested passively a few times uh, in a few different projects in Texas and in Florida because we were thinking about going out into those markets ourselves. But everything else that we do is just ours. And so I hear the argument both ways. Like some of sometimes we say, hey, I, I don't want a boss. Like that was my entire purpose in life, like not to be working for other people. So if I syndicate, then I'm working for other people. But then on the flip side, you know, Kenny's in a mass and masterminds with Tons of other guys that are doing you stuff like this. Heard of the hundred mil. Yeah, yeah. So, yep. and they're saying, "How dare you guys? You have all this expertise. You know what you're doing. <laughs> How come you're not helping your friends and family and people that you yeah, know?" I, I would agree with them. I, I got to say to you, the fact that you're not syndicating means you're, you know, you're taking money out of your family's mouth. It, it, you can't have the expertise you have and think that other people have it. And even a small syndication fund where you, you teach them a little discipline for them to understand that they need to give this period of time. So. If you look at your, this is the thing that's freaking me out, right? And then Buffett's 92, uh, uh, still running Berkshire Hathaway. I'm 53, overweight. And I'm looking at well, how long do I have, how many more 10-year cycles do I have? And in my mind, if I have two 10-year cycles, I'm syndicated like crazy. So I just started a uh, oil and gas syndication because with oil and gas, you get the write-off of the drilling credit mm -hmm. from day one. So if you put 100 grand in, you have a, approximately around a $70,000 write-off first year against your income. And then you get the oil money back and you can recycle it in the next fund and the next fund. And so I bought a lot of oil and gas land with a partner and and uh, and buying more and, and, and involved in some leases there. And I'm syndicating there and I'm gonna syndicate in some of the real estate I have because I feel like, hey, there's only a couple more of these 10 year cycles that I have before I'm not really doing those kind of deals anymore, right? And you guys look pretty youthful. You gotta ask yourself, how many more cycles do you have where you can put together a fund and go buy some real estate you can keep for a long time. Um, so I, I think without that leverage and you have to do it all on your own, it is a choice as to whether you want to have to deal with the public or and deal with their money, or do you want to just keep it your own? I mean, there's an argument to keep it your own, but then it's going to grow slower, right? You're not going to have that, the freedom you have to get better deals and bigger deals, et cetera. So um, syndication is a, it's a scary thing, but once you get started at it, it's pretty easy to understand.
Yeah. You know, I mean, we have plenty of the experience. I think it is just taking the first step, like anything, like buying your first deal, you know, that's scary at first and then doing your first syndication. That's another different step, but we've definitely, I mean, we managed 1500 units here in San Diego. We buy our own stuff. We've done all, like, we've pretty much done every side of the cycle that you could possibly imagine. So you manage 1500 doors or own 1500 doors. We managed. we managed it. I had a management company and I sold it to like a startup out of uh, the Bay area in 2017. But yeah, we were managing about 1500 units at that time. So wow. definitely have the experience there. Plus our own ownership. You know, we had our own rehab crews. We did everything. It was like full service in house. So I've handled every single, I mean, I help people buy buildings, sell buildings, vacate them, you know, release them all of it. So yeah, we definitely have hey. all the experience and we should. <laughs> yeah. You got, you have too much experience to not do it. That, yeah, this I, is personal yeah. opinion. Not that you asked, but that that's my, <laughs> personal, that's my personal opinion. Yeah. I, I have a question for you. And then, uh, honest, this is a great segue to the coaching. Cause I feel like I'm getting coached a little bit in this podcast, which I love. I think that's amazing. Um, so I think one of the things that I hear a lot of people say is that, you know, you need at least seven streams of income or 10 streams of income, you know, that's how people get wealthy. Uh, but I think a lot of people get, uh, too scattered, basically not focused because they're trying to do all these things at once. And they end up actually making a lot less because they're not focused or they have too many things going on and they haven't mastered the one thing. So what do you think about that? And what's kind of your advice to people who are listening to this saying, hey, I need seven streams of income. How do you go about doing that successfully? I mean, you've got a ton going on. So how are you managing all of this? How did you get to this point? Yeah, I don't. The seven streams of income thing, is, I don't agree with. I think that is it active income or passive income? If you have seven streams of passive income, where you're not doing the work, then I understand that. Like you say, okay, I'm gonna own, I'm gonna go in, I'm gonna go into Grant Cardone's syndication fund, and I'm gonna own a few properties with him, but I'm not doing the work. And if that's a stream of income for you, great. But in terms of businesses that you're running, your daily bread, you have to know what your daily bread is first, where your activity is first, and that that's working first. Like here's my here's my primary gig that I do, right? So I'm a lender. I lend a lot of money to public companies. They have to be public. I generally have done that for such a long time. I sort of know that space. I know where I can make money there. I know how to make money lending. I'm an investor. So I, I'm an activist investor. So I take over a lot of companies. I recently took over the largest karaoke company in the world. I bought them by, by over the open market and bought 57% of the company. So I kind of know my couple skill sets. Then I know how to raise money and bring a company public. So that's my third skill set. But it's sort of in the same realm, right? Now, do I have income from other places? Yeah, the real estate and uh, own some Bitcoin and uh, some other things that are passive, et cetera. Um, but I don't actively manage seven streams of income. I think that that is, that is a, that's like almost like a made up, it's a fallacy. Um, I, I, I I, I would say to you, the richest people, if you, there's a, there's a thing that you want to, I would say is do you want to be really rich or do you want to be really comfortable? And you're probably going to say, well, if you're really rich, aren't you really comfortable? No, no, definitely not. Uh, so if you looked at like someone like Bezos, his entire massive wealth was focused on one thing. And then as he got wealth, he diversified that out into other things that he just like loved or he could be passive with that someone else ran. Bill Gates has Cascade and a vast majority of Cascade is run by somebody else. He's put billions into Cascade, his investment company, but he doesn't run the day-to-day -day of Cascade. Um, someone really smart and educated runs his money for him, right? Now Bill gets the reports and makes sure that he understands what's happening. He's not a, he's not a, uh, he's a very intelligent guy, but he, if you look at John Malone who ran uh, Liberty, uh, who ran TCI, which is now Liberty Media, he owns F1. Oh, in the first 30 years of his career, he was very focused on cable. So mega wealth is created by concentration, right? They could argue, wait, Buffett's not concentrated. He has a bunch of companies. No, he's done it pretty much all through one company that he's generated cash through investing and taken that money and reinvested in the insurance business, right? So he's pretty focused on one thing. That's sort of mega wealth. If you want to be comfortable and you want to like, hey, we make combined a million dollars a year and we have, you know, 10 different properties and we invest a little bit here and there, then I kind of get that. But the seven streams thing, I'm not buying. I just, because to me, that's not like, it's not repeatable. It's like, I would be focused on, like, 
if you were in the buggy whip business and you were all in with buggy whips and eventually they didn't need that many buggy whips and the buggy whip companies were going out of business, you'd argue, well, wow, I was too focused. But then you're, you're not really focused because if you know sales are declining, you have to divest. You would say, well, who's replacing my business? Well, it's the automotive business. And if you would have understood that, you could have created a ton of wealth for yourself in the automotive business. So if you're focused on one area that's doing really well and building wealth, if you're paying attention to it, you kind of know it's changing. Um, and that's happened to me over a lot of years. So I, I, I mean, you guys are in commercial lending. So you guys are at the whims of rates and all kinds of activity, et cetera. But you're still in the real estate business. So you are really actually in one business. You just happen to have a few offset streams of the same business, whether it be I manage business, I service them, I arrange for contractors, I do I do rehab and then resell them, or I do rehab and syndication. It's all sort of the same business. You're not you're not saying to me I, I own a McDonald's too, right? Now you could, <laughs> right? Right, but you if you owned a McDonald's and all your real estate businesses, trust me, you, you'd be like stressed out of your mind. So, um, I just love hearing that from you because uh, I feel like. I've, I've definitely heard this said many different times. Some people say 10, some people say, you know, eight, what, however many streams of income, but I feel like I've only ever heard it from people who have nothing. You know what I mean? So yeah, it's nice to yeah, have somebody I, here who's built something serious, who's built wealth, done a lot to say that's a bunch of BS. Yeah. I, I, at one point last year, uh, well, when was the Skyla? Probably two years ago. In June, I think of 2021, Alzheimer's went public. And for a period of a four or five days, my wife and I were worth around a billion, a billion five, right? And we had almost all of our net worth in one public company. And it didn't matter. It changed nothing because I knew I wasn't going to be a seller. I want to sell this when these, the drugs for Alzheimer's are, you know, uh, ready to go into, into humans or they're approved. So now we have one drug in, in phase two, uh, for a treatment for Alzheimer's. And then we have a vaccine going live in Alzheimer's patients uh, in March, right? And it's a public company. The stock has come down dramatically from where it went public. And so, but I'm still in the same space. And that is that I'm in the space of bring companies public. I'm an investor in public companies. I'm an investor in biotech or real estate, et cetera. And so I have diversity over the 700 million of assets that the companies own and I own and public and private and all that stuff. And I'm not getting into specifics, but it's really still the same concentrated effort that I make and for you guys, and this is where you get another stream of income, is you're like, well, it, it's it's a normal it's a normal pattern that everything you guys have learned with 15 years, 17 years of experience can be translated into helping other people do it and they can invest with you. That's a really standard model, but it's one that if you just stuck with, you could get really wealthy doing because you're delivering a service that other people, remember consistency is like 80% of the game, right? Showing up and doing it all the time is, is the game. So if you're able to pivot and say, hey, the markets went against us now, we're launching a fund, an opportunity fund to buy distressed real estate, and you can be part of this, and here's our target, then eventually you have a business, but it's sort of all in the same space, but there may be six or seven income streams. People that are saying you need seven streams are ones that I, at least my experience, I'm not saying it's wrong, but my experience is like, oh, I'm getting two grand a month on, on Amazon drop, drop shipping and all this other those are not scalable. Remember what I, I said in the beginning, there's only three ways to make money, leverage people, leverage time or leverage money. Those are the only three ways you can make real wealth, right? And you guys, the way you can leverage people is to syndicate, right? And so when a person says seven things, what are they really, really leveraging? That's what I would question. Because if they're doing all seven, they're doing seven things poorly. They're not doing seven things great. Get one thing right and then move on to the next thing. Get one thing really well, but if you're really in a great business, you're once you learn one thing, you're not going to want to go away from that because you're going to learn that and you're going to figure out all the angles to be the best at it. You're going to expand from San Diego like you guys are. I mean, you're managing 1,500 units and you sold that to somebody. That in itself is impressive, right? Just that one thing, right? So if you decided to run a management company now, I was just having a conversation with my partner last night, my business partner. And he said that he remembered this deal where they put $100 million into venture capital and the deal went bust, went bankrupt. And the guy who founded it learned all those mistakes on that 100 million. No one wanted to invest in the second deal. He only raised like a couple million, restarted as a new company. And that company went on to sell for 600 million a few years later. Wow. So 
it, it, I would tell you the number one thing I see people make the mistake on is they don't understand that if you want to go to a teaching hospital, if you don't want to learn from somebody else and you want to do it yourself and you think you know what you're doing and you don't, you're going to get, you're going to get an ass whipping first. You're going to, so the reason why people pay you or take a course or want to do syndication with you, if they're busting into the game is so that you can tell them, here's all the stupid mistakes I've made. Right. And I promise you, you guys have made a bunch of them. And I can assure you that I've made so many mistakes and it's only consistency and persistence and a commitment to what I want to do that lets me keep going. I've, I've been down, down to the, you know, I've been beaten into the ground, but I wanted to be on Wall Street my whole life. So I stuck with it on days when I didn't want to be here, you know, uh, and I thought about doing other things and it brought me back here. I, can't, I, I, I probably harped on the seven streams of income too much. <laughs> you guys, no, it's you good. guys. I, I think it's good though. I like, I think people need to hear this more because like, uh people are all over the place to me you know there's so many distractions and pe like you said and the big thing when i'm in rooms with guys that have done big things it's like get focus get clarity right it's like quit you know get rid of all the shiny objects it's hard because this world's distracted when warren buffett and bill gates got together as friends uh the parents and families knew each other somehow and they brought them together mary i think it was mary gates uh, who brought them together and they they were in a room and Warren Buffett's father or not or Bill Gates's father asked him to write down what they believed the number one thing that they had that made them successful and both of them without even consulting each other on the same piece of paper wrote focus right focus leads to everything else it's it's it, when you when you when you're trying to focus on seven different things you're going to get nowhere right? and that's probably the hardest lesson I've learned which is Well, also, <laughs> uh, uh, I was just about to say that that uh, when the company went public a year and a half ago, Ultimend, and it was worth it, we were worth it, the bill, business went public and it traded to about $3 billion worth for a couple of days. Someone said to me, wow, man, this has happened almost overnight. And I said to him, I started the company five years ago. <laughs> I've been at this for 30 years. It's, it, it, if it's overnight, it's not really real. I mean, you you get the you see the the social network, the movie with with uh, the with Zuckerberg concept, and you see it dramatized, but it's never really overnight. And if it is, it's a rare circumstance, and it's a circumstance of survival that's rare. It's not it's not the norm. There's no real overnight. It doesn't have any value if it's really overnight. The thing the things that have value take time, like your relationship. You guys have been together a long time. That's what has value. And that's what will keep you guys in check. And that goes back to my original point, which is the relationship, starting with your spouse. If you guys are you guys are doing this together, that's a rarity, but you guys are doing it together. That'll keep you in check to make sure, do we really want to go off and open a burger joint? And she may say, yeah, we do, because guess what? We're going to go buy the land behind her, every burger joint, and we're going to do real estate and burgers. Maybe that works for you guys, like it did for McDonald's, but uh only time the pressure of time creates any real well real wor worth you know net worth um i want to jump to something else what's what's exciting you for 2023 uh you know i i hate to for me personally i'm launching something called bitnow.com which will be the first when will this be when will this be published by you guys Two, two weeks. weeks. So we're launching something in the metaverse that's never been done before. And that'll be out before this next two weeks to tell you guys about it. So uh, I'm very focused on um, that. I believe Bitcoin is, is here to stay. And if you look at the history about like at what just happened with SBF and, and FTX and the, and the debacle that happened in crypto and that sort of sell off last year, that sets the stage for the fact that that asset is still here to stay. It's uncorruptible Bitcoin. It's been around now for 11, 12 years. And so I think everyone has to own some. And my mission right now with bitnow.com is to create an environment where Bit Bitcoin and other crypto can be, there's a use case for it. Now I'm Bitcoin centric, but it doesn't mean you won't be able to use other things on our platform to buy 
and sell and have adventures and experiences and be in the metaverse and do amazing things and gamble and have fun and entertainment and Bitcoin centric. So we're going to reward everyone with Bitcoin that comes to the network every day. You get a little little present Bitcoin in your account every day, uh, every 24 hour period. You're going to have tasks and opportunities in the metaverse to earn more Bitcoin. You're able to spend that Bitcoin on things in our marketplace, either in the physical world or the digital world. Um, that's what I'm excited about. I'm excited about the future of crypto. Um, but if it, when it pertains to real estate, I'm still a multifamily housing guy. I, I, I don't, I think that if you just wake up every day and say, I have a dollar, uh, half your dollar should go in owning uh, apartment buildings. So what, what, do you, what do you think of what's your, uh, I guess, two questions. What is your outlook for Bitcoin or crypto and then real estate? Um, on the real estate side, uh, I think the cap rates have got a little out of control and the higher rates have brought that back to a little reality. I mean, we're even having, you know, issues with St. Petersburg and kind of what we're going to do there in the space. Unfortunately, the demand for apartment buildings is still going to be there. And so they're still going to have to be built in people. This, this is just not something that's going to go away. It's just the debt um, markets, right? The debt, it's just debt. The debt markets not, are messed up right now yeah. a little bit. But once that stabilizes out, I think that it, to me, if you could wake up every day and say, I'm going to put half my money in multifamily, I'm going to put the 25% in real estate and 25%, uh, excuse me, uh, half my money in real estate, 25% uh, of my money in the market and 25% of my money in my bank account. Then you sort of have this nice mix because that long-term income turns into something big, you know? I just bought a, a, a house last year with my son uh, for, my, for my wife. And so my son owns half, my wife owns half because uh, I want her to have rental income. When he moves out, we'll rent that property out. I think you've got to keep that in mind is the how do you get something that's compounding over time. Um, when I look at Bitcoin though, when you own an apartment building, you have to maintain it, you have to paint it, you have to keep upkeep. Bitcoin is the only asset you can really own that you can store it's easy to store digitally and you never have to provide it any maintenance of any kind. And there are only a certain limited amount that they're making and they're never going to make any more of them. So I'm a huge fan of Bitcoin. I have been for years, like years and years and years. And I've got my ass kicked in some years and uh, a year and a half ago or so, a year ago, I put 150 million into miners who were a big wow. mining operation. We own a big data center, 617,000 square feet in Michigan. So I just, hate to practice the same religion over and over again, buy multifamily, put 25% of your money in the market and things like the S&P, unless you know something. So the S&P 500 and the other 25%, keep your cash so you can buy more real estate. Because ask yourself this question, if real estate values went down by half, if, if apartment buildings went down by 50%, would you buy more? Would people are going to need an apartment? Yeah, yeah they are. absolutely. There's, there's, there's nothing to discuss. Like it's like, it. sometimes it's that simple. And people inherently want to make things complicated. I, uh, when I was a broker early in my career, I would, if I wanted to sell a gold mine in Zimbabwe, I could get a hundred people to buy it. But if I said buy AT and T because it has a good dividend, they're like, ah, AT and T. But the Zimbabwe <laughs> thing, they're all over it. <laughs> you got to make it complicated. Um, yeah, this has been fun. So, cup, let me just ask you, uh, where's the best place people can find you, learn more about you, because you got a lot of good stuff going on. Uh, the simplest way is to go to toddalt.com. Um, they can sign up at toddalt.com and follow me. And I'll, I, I'm on social, on Instagram, I'm verified on Instagram. I'm verified on Twitter. I think I'm verified on YouTube. I'm, I, I'm, I think I'm verified on everything. Uh, and I'm pretty accessible, actually. Uh, it's pretty easy to get a hold of me. I'm we pretty much, I have a two, I have a full-time assistant, executive assistant, and then a chief of staff. And we answer pretty much everything, you know, as long as the people aren't crazy. Um, Cool. I mean, I, everyone has everyone has haters, but uh, but now I'm interested to know when you guys are going to syndicate. Yeah. Well. Well. I mean, I want to we'll keep in touch. Well, when I go to <laughs> when I go to Vegas, I'm going to hit you up. I want to come. I'd like to see you face to face. This is fun. You come to Vegas. We 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 moved here two years ago from uh, Newport Beach, Orange County area. I grew up there for 46 years, and I assure you, one of the best moves I ever made was moving to Vegas. Everyone comes to Vegas. Come to Vegas. Uh, uh, we, unfortunately, I was just down there speaking at an event with Greg Reed. I was just in San Diego, like just a, like last week, right? Uh, so I, I'd love for you to come to Vegas or 
come to the Long Beach Grand Prix. We have an indie team, which we sponsor, or come to one of the races, uh, bring your family. You said you have kids? Yeah. How old are they? Two and a half and four. Girls, two girls. Uh, they won't be too big fans of the race car. <laughs> uh, yeah, you, yeah, unless you have earmuffs on them, they're not going to like the sound of those things. But um, I'd love for you to come to Vegas when you have time. Yeah, I will. Absolutely. I love that little JSX flight from San Diego to Vegas. It makes it a lot easier. Easy flight. Yeah, we uh, we just bought here at the company, we just bought a G550 from uh, a beautiful Gulfstream. And uh, wow. we took it to San Diego. We took the crew down there to speak and attend a couple events. And um, kind of the same similar thing to JSX, although JSX is open to the public. But that's an easy flight. You kind of don't have to go through the same rigmarole as you do with uh, – with, uh, like going through TSA and all that nightmare that you have to deal with at the regular airports. But yep. um, and next time I'm down there, I'll ping you guys too. Yeah, Absolutely. for sure. I know you got to go, Sash. You one last question. We kind of end. So I'd like to get your thoughts on it. What's your uh, definition of generational wealth? <laughs> I would say it, it, I have a different definition and that is, when a, when a family member comes to borrow money from me, I usually say to them, um, you know, if they wanted to borrow five grand, I'd give them the five grand and say, you don't owe me the money because you got something going on and you need a break, right? I think generational wealth is that you have the ability to take care of your family where everyone has enough to be comfortable, but not enough to do nothing. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, and that's sort of, you've heard that statement before. That's sort of a Warren Buffett mentality. Um, generational wealth. I mean, you guys are perfect examples. You have, I mean, if you think about it, right, you have two little ones. Imagine if you build an apartment portfolio, what a competitive advantage they're going to have when they get older, that their parents own real estate that they're going to inherit and those two girls, and I, now we're going to go down a path that we, you know, we probably, I didn't sign up for and neither did you. But when I had my first daughter born, she's 24 now, I used to say to her all the time, I don't have a problem if you want to grow up and have a family and not work, but you're going to get an education and not have to listen to a man control you and tell you what to do and that he has the income and you don't. Your choice will be to be a mother. You don't have to be a mother, right? So imagine what you're doing for your two girls is that you're going to empower them to say, hey, I own real estate that my parents have left me and I don't have to do anything. I choose to do it, right? That's generational wealth. That, And quite honestly, all I really care about besides the fact that I really do want all my shareholders to make money, but I can't control the market. But the things I can control is how I treat my employees and how I treat my family. And I cut all my employees in on all deals we do. That's the best I try to do with them. Can't always do it because they're not always accredited, but I try the best there. And I always make sure that what I'm doing is going to leave something for my family. Um, and if you do that and you teach them to make the right decisions, then they pass it on. That's the powerful part of what's happening here. So I think generational wealth is important if there's a logic behind it, right? And so and if you had a boy and, and uh, uh, you know, I, so I'm not a sexist about this. I know that people like say, well, it's the same. It's not the same because sometimes, Sometimes women want to have a family. They want to be home. My assistant wants to be home with her kids. There's nothing wrong with that. In fact, I think it's the most noble thing you can do is raise the next generation. But she's educated now where she doesn't have to make that choice. She doesn't, she's not forced to not be able to work if she doesn't want to. I mean, I mean, you see my, that's, so you're empowering your daughters to make decisions that at least I, as a kid, didn't have those decisions. My mom was a single mom who didn't have anything and any support of any kind, not a dime. So generational wealth to me is whether you're passing on something to their kids that, ha that has some sort of meaning that can help them and then their kids going forward. I think that that's my definition. It's a great answer. I love that. Um, I know you have to run. So I really appreciate your time. I think this was amazing. I it went in a direction that I did not expect in, in a very, in, in a great way. Um, and I can definitely see how you'll be fabulous at coaching and your courses and all of that. Cause you definitely have everything that I could think of that would be a mentor. Um, so absolutely. Care. yeah, like thank you, you so much. I appreciate that. All right. We'll catch up again. Yes. Yeah. Thanks. Have a good day. Take right. care guys. Uh -huh. Bye-bye.